All right, <laughs> we'll do that again. All right, welcome everybody. So we're we are going to talk about the new stewardship requirements. Um, Sumaya uh, was going to be here today, but she she uh, couldn't make it. So uh, you know, but she uh, uh, is an amazing resource and has really uh, done a wonderful job with uh, with helping yeah. us put this together. And if you have any questions at all, please interrupt us and uh, either interrupt us, take yourself off mute and ask a question, or you can uh, put it in the chat and uh, we'll be sure to see it. Uh, this is kind of a uh, very, I don't want to say complicated topic, but it's it's got a lot of uh, a lot of little things to discuss and, um, you know, that some of it, it can be kind of interpreted in different ways. And, and part of that was on purpose. Some of the People that put together the requirements when they give talks on this, they say it's it's uh, not very straightforward, uh, and and it's not all as clear as it could be. Um, it's it's meant to kind of be a little bit open to interpretation, and I think they do that kind of stuff because they want to see uh, hospitals um, have a little bit of uh, leeway to do things there and individualize it and do it their own way. Um, which is good to give some leeway, but it's also not great when you're making requirements that people need to follow, you know? Uh, so we'll get right into it. And uh, here are the regulatory updates. And we're gonna be talking about um, conditions of participation with CMS and also uh, discussing the joint commission. And a lot of them overlap, but it's good to go over uh, kind of uh, what they are specifically, and then how to meet them. So not only talking about it kind of in an abstract form of this is what they require, but what are the action items? What can you do to meet the requirements? Yeah, and there's a lot of overlap between Joint Commission and CMS. And if your facility is not Joint Commission um, required, but just CMS, it, it all overlaps really well. So you're meeting it either way. Yeah, no, a lot of it they take from um, uh, the CDC, so that what the CDC uh, says are the what they devise as the requirements, and then the uh, uh, requirements to have a complete antimicrobial stewardship program in hospitals. And this really is is discussing stewardship programs within hospitals. So talking about inpatients, and it doesn't really touch on outpatients. So for the Joint Commission EP10, what they're saying is the hospital allocates financial resources for staffing and information technology to support the antibiotic stewardship program. So allocates resources is a big, uh, important topic for Joint Commission, but it is also the same um, requirement that CMS has had for many years now. So, um, you know, having a pharmacy leader, Ideally, also having a pharmacy leader at your site that has some FTE or time dedication is important. Plus being able to work with MD stewardship uh, with us, you're also allocating resources. So you're meeting those, you know, if you're doing those type of allocation, then you're meeting the resources that you need for your stewardship program, working with us and having dedicated personnel. But we'll get into that next one. Anything else, Dr. Horn, you want to add to that? Oh, and, and one way to show that you're allocating resources and that it's a priority uh, is to have a, uh, a letter of commitment and having a letter of commitment, you know, signed by hospital leadership. And that was uh, in the past, Infectious Disease Society of America had a example of a commitment letter that we've used and, and individualized it for each hospital that we work with. Um, and so if you don't have that, we can always provide that with you. Uh, provide it for you. If, if you're looking through, you know, your documents and you're not seeing that, you know, we'd be happy to send that to you. Yeah, we could give you a template and yeah. you could take that and uh, make it your own for your own facility to kind of make sure there's a letter of commitment and leadership has signed on to that. And EP11, it's revised. The governing body appoints a physician or a pharmacist who is qualified through education and training or experience in infectious disease antimicrobial stewardship as a leader of an antibiotic stewardship program. The appointment is based on recommendation of med staff leadership and pharmacy leadership. So um, again, just like CMS, how they had it before, it's really important to appoint a pharmacy leader 
or a physician leader at your facility. Um, of course, you're working with us, so you have pharmacy and physicians working with you all through MD stewardship, but it's also going to be important to have a pharmacy or physician leader at your facility as well. I'm going to stop here. Um, any questions so far? I, I saw somebody unmute. I think it was yeah. Holly. Holly, yeah. do you have any questions? Yeah, so it's going to be really important for each facility, healthcare facility, to make sure that you all have a designated pharmacy leader or physician leader or both co-leading. And, and we've gotten this as a question before where, where people will say, well, I have no specific training in this area, but you can see it also says experience. Um, it, so if you've had experience leading your program, um, even if you have no specific training in infectious disease or stewardship, if you've been you know, doing it for a while and, and you understand and, and you have the experience you know, that also helps. And, you know, um, but but it's good to appoint specific champions of the program um, because sometimes people will feel like, oh, stewardship is everybody's responsibility. And then and then if the program, uh, you know, isn't doesn't really have a, a designated leader, then, you know, the question is, who do you look to to make sure that it's actually working and everything? And so um, while stewardship is everybody's responsibility, uh, to have a program, it's good to have a designated leader uh, and, and specific champions uh, that, that will follow up on the program and make sure that it's, it's working well. So this is kind of the CMS requirement, so kind of overlaps with the um, Joint Commission. Again, hospital must designate an individual group or group individual or group of leaders as an antibiotic surgery program leader. Ideally, antibiotic surgery program is joint, led by pharmacy physician, a ph physician and pharmacist. The individual must be appointed by the hospital governing body based on the recommendation of med staff leadership and pharmacy leadership. The hospital must ensure high level hospital clinical leaderships, um, specifically leadership from the medical staff and pharmacy service uh, involved in antimicrobial stewardship. Again, it's a very similar requirement to joint commission. So I think it's just important for every facility to have a physician and a pharmacy leader or um, just a physician or pharmacy, whatever is available and able to be uh, do. Um, and then just like Dr. Horn said earlier, if you have been doing this already, that means you have had experience doing antimicrobial stewardship. So you don't have to, you know, you have experience, but you don't have to recreate or, you know, if you don't have an ID trained physician or ID trained pharmacist, you don't have to go hire somebody because you've already been doing it, you have experience, if that makes sense. And EP12, go ahead. Oh, so the leaders of the antibiotic stewardship program is responsible for, and then it kind of goes through um, each of these. So developing and implementing a hospital-wide stewardship program based on guidelines, documenting stewardship activities. So not only are you implementing uh, interventions, but you're also documenting and you're seeing, do they work in reporting, communicating and collaborating with the medical staff. So this is, you know, making an intervention, seeing if, following it, seeing if it works, and then reporting it and communicating with the medical staff, uh, nursing leadership, pharmacy leadership, as well as the hospital's infection prevention and control, and then uh, providing competency-based training and education for staff, including medical staff on practical applications. And this is one of the new ones, this competency-based training and education. So when it comes to competency-based training and education, you know, not only are they being uh, educated, but, um, you know, usually places will have a few multiple choice questions to, to test and uh, essentially for the competency-based part of it. Um, now, I think we've all, we're all familiar with modules and things like that. Um, you know, uh, from our standpoint, we were discussing um, having some uh, short uh, presentations similar to these webinars, or uh, perhaps a shorter webinar, and then having a few questions afterwards. So it, it wouldn't be as long as our regular webinars, they would be shorter. And then having questions that go along with it, essentially to test competency. Um, 
And I wonder if you all will find that helpful, um, you know, later on when we talk about it, they're addressing certain topics like C. diff, asymptomatic bacteria, UTI, which we have already done a lot of teaching on. But Dr. Horn and I can make that smaller, like, you know, bite size, you know, in 15, 20 minutes with like pre and post questions, like three or four questions before and after um, so that, you know, anybody could log in and do that if needed and wanted some feedback. Is that something you will find helpful? You know, and, and I hope so. I uh, have done quite a number of modules as everyone else has. And I, I think that, you know, having these types of presentations um, would be more helpful than, you know, creating modules. But, you know, we would love to hear feedback. We want to make it, um, you know, as helpful and as educational and, not take up extra time as much as possible. Uh, so we would make them shorter and then give people time to do, you know, some added on questions. So they would be uh, shorter with very specific topics and very uh, almost bullet point of the important points that we want people to learn. The only thing we have to work, uh, we're getting some feedback that they will love that. So we will work on that and get that out soon. Um, the only thing that we need to make sure is that when we do that, we could upload it on our website. We just, you know, whoever we need to work through how to make sure people are doing the competency. Will you track it in your own facility or will they just log in do and then they get their certificate of like completion? So we will circle back with you all and get some feedback. But our initial step would be, we're already developing a module that has some main topics of common infectious disease things, which will address antibiogram, UTI, C. diff, and skin and soft tissue infections. So it's a big module, but then we'll break it down and do small ones as well. So everybody's able to do pre and post questions and be able to meet, meet the needs of the requirements. And another question we've gotten uh, a lot lately, or uh, who are these webinars open to? And they're open to everyone at your facility. Um, so anyone at your facility, you know, uh, has access to these webinars. Uh, we've recently closed it to the public, and and we've done that for a couple of reasons. Uh, but but one is to we want to focus on your facilities because your facilities are the uh, most important ones when it comes to uh, education and webinars. Um, and for these education. Um, the competency-based education and training, you know, we'd like everyone at your facility to be able to watch these and, um, and, and complete that and get certificates and show, um, um, show competency. So, but we'd love to hear uh, feedback. If anyone, you know, has uh, anything they'd like to share with us, please email us uh, your thoughts on that. Um, let's see, in the other things on this slide, it, it discusses Zoho documents. I think uh, basically, if you look at it, what they're saying here is you have to have a stewardship committee. Um, you have to have um, leadership from all different areas. And do you look at data, what you're doing? Um, so if you have, we have provide Zoho. So if you're in putting the interventions there, then you could get a report. Or if you have Epic or, you know, you Paradox and you do events, other ways of pulling out what you're doing in your um, uh, electronic medical records, that shows that you're being able to collect data. And, you know, when it says um, the third communication, all collaborating medical staff, nursing staff, leaders, pharmacy leaders, it's going to be important to have a multidisciplinary committee. Um, so it could be part of like just stewardship committee by itself or tagged on to quality or infection prevention where all these leaders are present. And it's also gonna be important to like whatever you all discuss once or twice a year, send these meeting minutes or what you're doing to your medical staff and other leaders so they're aware. So just being able to create that um, pathway, um, you know, where do you discuss it and how do you make sure everybody knows about stewardship in your system? Easiest way to do that is to make sure it's always brought up in a big meeting about stewardship and it's discussed as an agenda or adding stewardship meetings to a larger meeting like quality or infection prevention. And then next slide would be. And then in designating stewardship leaders, hospitals must assure that individuals so designated are qualified through education, training, experience, 
or certification. Uh, and this one we discussed as far as joint commission, and this is um, really saying the similar thing. And ensure hospital specific uh, antimicrobial stewardship leader is qualified through training. Uh, examples of this is SIDP, this is um, Society of Infectious Disease Pharmacists. There's, there's a stewardship certificate. Uh, MD stewardship uh, team has physicians, ID board certified and trained. So um, that would qualify as well. So if you have a physician who's board certified, who's a leader that should qualify, working with us, we have um, certificates and we're qualified. And also if you have pharmacy leaders, um, you know, if you are able to do the uh, SIDP ASP certificate, that is also very helpful. And, and here, yeah, go ahead. Oh, and this is just another one, essentially very similar. This is CMS uh, condition of participation. Stewardship staff should maintain their qualifications through ongoing education and training. So uh, like uh, CME, um, and stewardship courses, local and national. Uh, so we have uh, stewardship conferences within Nebraska, so the regional conferences, and then there are also national conferences. Um, and we are supplying education through our, our webinars as well. And here this is, CMS does not specify either the number of antibiotic stewardship staff to be designated, or the number of antibiotic stewardship hours that must be devoted. However, resources must be adequate to accomplish the tasks required. So they're essentially saying, do you have uh, the necessary resources and the, the necessary staff to complete the tasks at hand? Uh, and I, I think this is, again, one of the challenges hospitals have are getting the resources. So getting leadership to, to devote um, not only saying it's a priority, uh, but also, you know, showing that it's a priority and taking action through uh, devoting money towards stewardship, whether that be uh, additional staffing or additional resources uh, to get the, uh, make sure it's, it's a, um, you know, accomplishes the tasks that are needed to be accomplished. And I think working with us is great um, because you have that extra resource, but it one of the other important thing is making sure the pharmacist on site who's doing this work also has that time that is needed. So I think, um, you know, talking to leadership and making sure that that commitment is continued is very important. <coughs> antibiotic stewardship staff must um, develop and implement policies governing optimal use of antibiotics. So, you know, developing hospital-wide antibiotic stewardship policies, um, core elements, NEP, NT antibiotics restrictions, antibiotic timeouts, interdisciplinary work, um, antibi antibiogram for microbiology, infection prevention work with CDI, I can outline MD stewardship, antimicrobial stewardship support. So it's very broad. Um, antimicrobial stewardship staff must develop and implement policies governing the optimal use of antibiotics. Um, but you know some of the things that are helpful is if you have a surgical site, um, you know surgical site infection like pre-op prophylaxis. If you have um, order sets that you're kind of following, governing those all will be helpful. Um, what do you think, Dr. Hohen? Does that kind of sum it up? Oh yes, I think it does. Yeah. And. Hospitals must implement and maintain an active and hospital-wide antibiotic stewardship program that reflects the scope and complexity of the hospital services provided. And, you know, when it comes to stewardship programs, um, you know, staff at hospital dedicated to stewardship work um, and MD stewardship is available to assist at any time. And it's pretty much same as the EP10. So again, lots of overlap with Joint Commission and um, CMS. And I kind of wanted to talk about how to run a stewardship meeting because you know it kind of ties into the, all the requirements. So having a stewardship committee structure, they don't specify um, exactly how to have it, um, but it's nice to have major stakeholders in your stewardship committee when you have that. 
So, you know, pharmacy leaders, physician leaders, infection prevention leader, microbiology leaders, quality leaders, CMO, CNO, if they're able to attend. So it's important to have major stakeholders. And um, again, this, and they don't tell you how often to have a stewardship meeting. So you could have it quarterly, twice a year, however it works for your facility, as long as you all agree, we will have it twice a year, we will have it three times a year, what works for you all. Larger facilities is ideal if you could have a stewardship meeting by itself, because you might have a lot of things that you're dealing with. But smaller facilities, it's okay to um, add your stewardship agenda if you can with your quality agenda or infection prevention agenda. So you could have a, you know, a meeting with multiple different um, committees involved. So a stewardship is tagged onto quality OIP. If that will bring all the stakeholders together. The important part is making sure you all have all the stakeholders as part of this committee. If you want to have it separately, it's great, but you can also have it with quality. And a lot of places that we see, they have their ASB meeting part of quality meeting, dedicate and they dedicate some time to ASB, or they have it part of infection prevention and have you know divided time. So however you want to design it, there's no um, this is how you should do it, whatever works for your facility, the duration, how often, when, and how to have the meetings. Yes, yeah, so yeah. I really like how you're saying, making sure all the important people are in the meeting, because, you know, if you're discussing something like uh, sepsis or septic shock, and then you realize, oh, you know, it would be helpful if we had the phlebotomists here to make sure that we get things drawn really quickly, or, uh, you know, if there's anyone that needs to be invited to the meeting, I think that's really key and, and uh, you know, making sure that, you know, for example, things in septic shock, things are done very quickly. Yeah, and that's why sometimes it's nice to, if you're a smaller facility, to have it with infection prevention, um, because you know you already have this, you already have this meeting, you already have the stakeholders, all with quality, you already have all the major stakeholders of your facility and have dedicated time to also talk about antimicrobial stewardship. Next slide. Um, so here's an example of like a antimicrobial stewardship meeting agenda, like how you could run it. If you're gonna have it by itself or with another committee, you know, it's important to have attendance who's part of this discussion. And it's important to take minutes and follow up actions. So when you come back in three or six months that you can discuss what you have worked on so far. And it's important to have the chairs or co-chairs present for stewardship. So on your site, who's the physician or pharmacy leader? Again, um, it's you do not have to have both. You could have one or the other, or if you have both, that's fantastic too. And start with, um, and some of the ways you could start a, uh, some of the stewardship thing uh, meetings is like positive note. So sometimes some facilities, they like to talk about good catches. You know, we had a patient with C. diff, he was non treatment. When we reviewed, we got him on the right treatment. Or we had a patient on MRSA, he was not on, he was on not being covered appropriately. When we reviewed, we got them on the right treatment. It also creates good positive morale for stewardship program. When you're talking about this in a large setting with their big stakeholders, they realize all the amazing work stewardship team is doing and the patient outcome that you're having um, you know, impact on. So it's really nice always to start with a good catch, one or two good catches. Yeah, and an example of that, um, and uh, just, just yesterday I was discussing with a hospital and the stewardship pharmacist was reviewing the chart and they they realized oh they uh, had an MRSA NARES that was positive and we were discussing their pneumonia uh, that was worsening and the patient transferred to the ICU but they weren't on MRSA coverage and so uh, you know I, I thought that was a really good catch so they said oh the MRSA NARES was positive but they're not on MRSA coverage and they contacted the hospitalist and said you know this came back positive and they're not on coverage and I thought that was a really good catch and yeah, I, I also like what you're saying about this shows people. This shows people what the stewardship programs are doing. This shows people what the stewardship programs are doing, and you know, I think it's sometimes it's not so clear about 
uh, to some of the leadership about what exactly is happening and when uh, with stewardship. And so starting with good catches shows everybody, oh, that made a really big difference uh, for that patient, especially. And when you report out to med staff or leadership in the future, having those good catches, it always reflects at the end of the day, we're doing this for our patients. Um, and then other things that you could report on a stewardship meeting is intervention. So if you are tracking intervention like IV to PO, um, you know, de-escalation, stopping antimicrobials, or if you're looking at um, Zoho intervention that you are tracking with MD stewardship, you can discuss those interventions and report them out. In your facility, if you have NHSN AU AR module that you're reporting to CDC, you could share those data. So you could share data that you have. Drug formula, another things that you could discuss is let's say that you had formulary change in your facility, you're going from oxacillin to nafacillin, and you could discuss that. Or if you're restricting ertapenem use for pre-op antibiotic, which we all should, <laughs> you should, you can discuss that. So these are some um, topics. Oh, if you have sepsis orders that you're updating, um, you know, or if you want to provide education on C. diff, for example, you you know, you could hand out a, a you hand out or share MD stewardship webinars. Here's MD stewardship education on C. diff. How do we now? Um, take this link and provide it to everybody else in the hospital system so they have a C diff webinar to listen. So like you could come up with different topics of how you want to prioritize for your own facility, but this is just an example. And this, this is the hospital has a multidisciplinary committee that oversees the stewardship program. Uh, must be composed of representation from medical staff, pharmacy, infection prevention, uh, infection control, nursing, microbiology, information technology, quality assessment, and performance. And the committee may include part-time or consultant staff and may include on either on-site or remote uh, remote help. So um, yes, this, this is very similar to- um, Like what they're talking about or what you're- would you be able to mute if you're not muted, please? Thank you. Um, I think, again, the message what we're hearing again on CMS and um, Joint Commission is just a multidisciplinary team and communication. It, we just talked about it and it comes back again. So again, having a multidisciplinary team works really well. So um, developing, you know, if you're going to discuss this in infection prevention, quality or standalone, um, ASB meeting, as long as you have all these stakeholders. And uh, as uh, for remote help, of course, you could add us on because we are also there remotely for MD stewardship helping your facilities. And the stewardship program demonstrates coordination among all components of the hospital uh, responsible for antibiotic use, resistance, including but not limited to infection prevention, control, quality, performance, uh, improvement, medical staff, nursing, pharmacy. And th this is important. Um, well, let's see. It says ASP program should work with infection prevention quality. Yeah, this is important because, um, you know, so everyone works together for the same common, uh, common goal. And, you know, it's important that people get feedback and work together and understand, you know, why things are uh, being done. Um, and that's also why it's important to include, you know, as many of the clinicians and, and people responsible for patient care, because uh, when they see why things are being done, they, they understand the importance of it. And when they get feedback about, uh, you know, how things are uh, being accomplished and, you know, um, that it, the program is being successful, it makes them to want to continue uh, doing these things instead of uh, you know, when people are, are only told, oh, you cannot use this antibiotic, they might get upset. But if they go to the committee and they understand why, and they understand there are other options for treating the patient, uh, you know, it, it helps with involvement. And it also helps with, with burnout when people understand uh, and that they're part of making the decisions as well. And, you know, if you see the team too, it's like EP11, EP12, EP13, EP14, over and over again, they're just emphasizing multidisciplinary team and communication. 
So that's why I think it's just having a good way of when all of you in each facility get together and how you discuss ASB. Um, and for me personally, that's why I think larger facilities having your own ASB meetings, smaller facilities tagging it on to quality or infection prevention accomplishes that because you will have all the other stakeholders there anyways. So you are able to do that, um, work, communicate amongst each other and be able to work on this. Antibiotic Surgery Program documents the evidence base of use of antimicrotics in all departments and services of the hospital. So here's where you wanna make sure ensure order sets are up to date. Um, so I know Sumaya have been helping with your all's order sets when help is needed, um, but that's an, one way of making sure we are using the right antimicrobials for right treatment and the right dose. And make, so that's a big one. Um, Track orders that use that medications are ordered according to guidelines. If you're able to track, that's really helpful. Ensure appropriate use of restrictor antimicrobial. So let's say you have a policy says do not use um, eritapenem only used for ESBL organism. Then making sure when it's ordered for other times, um, do you give feedback and how do you follow through on that? So big uh, for this requirement, one of the big one would be if you have order sets, making sure they're up to date and following through on those. And one of the things that we're gonna do, I know Sumaya has been helping with order sets. We are also gonna work on putting all our order sets on our website with a password protection. So um, whenever you all need different types of order set, you could sign in and get um, the order sets when needed. Yeah, and Attempt. that can be really helpful. Yeah, so getting an order set and then individualizing it for your hospital. and you know, a lot of these order sets have already gone through and been reviewed and, and um, you know, so they're, they're successful order sets and you just need to, you know, individualize it for your hospital, make sure, you know, it all makes sense for your program. But if you, you know, already have one, you don't have to recreate it, but if you need it, we're, we're in the process of uploading some of those. Yeah, and it, it really helps not, uh, not to start from scratch. You know, if there's already something that uh, has been successful and other programs have used, you know, we want to be uh, helpful and, and help create that. And here, the antibiotic stewardship program monitors the hospital's antibiotic use by analyzing data on days of therapy per 1,000 days present or 1,000 patient days, or by reporting antibiotic use data to the uh, National Healthcare Safety Network. So, you know, as, as far as tracking and reporting, uh, it's, it's important to track, uh, you know, whether it's days of therapy or however that uh, uh, however you track within your, your system. And uh, we can have a webinar on, on tracking if you'd find that helpful. You know, I, I think Sumeya um, uh, is really very knowledgeable about how to track and the best ways to do that. So if you would find that helpful, please let us know uh, because some of the hospitals find it challenging uh, as far as tracking. And, you know, if you're looking at specific medications like here, vancomycin, and, and yeah. trying to, to limit the use to only when appropriate. Um, yeah, so I think it's important to like, we don't have to like do all antibiotic, like it says, so you could pick like a couple of antibiotics you want to, for example, track. But if, you know, some of you all, all might already have the module to report to NHSN, bigger hospitals might have that already. But another option is to like calculate days of therapy. And if, uh, just like Dr. Horn said, if there's any, we could do a separate webinar with um, Sumaya and Krista Stash, if that will be helpful um, to learn more about that. And here, hospitals must implement and maintain an active hospital-wide stewardship program consistent with nationally recognized standards for improving antibiotic use. Uh, optimizing the use of antibiotics is critical to effective effectively treat uh, infections uh, and, and reduce harm. So uh, MD stewardship bases, we base all of our recommendations off of the CDC core elements and infectious disease society of America guidelines. Um, and so, uh, you know, creating order sets helps, helps to complete this and show that antibiotics are being used uh, appropriately and follow up after 40 to 72 hours to ensure antibiotics are still being used appropriately. So that would be 
uh, so the time these are just yeah just clarifying any one of these so working with us and we're following yeah. guidelines so that should also fulfill that as well just wanted to make sure that you know that just working with us me following those guidelines and then implements either pre-authorization for antibiotics or prospective audit with feedback, prospective review with feedback. So these are, are two of the top ways, uh, top interventions of stewardship programs. Um, there's pre-authorization, which is essentially asking permission. And that can be done within programs. You know, we're happy to discuss and help pro programs implement pre-authorization if they would like. And then prospective review and feedback uh, and this is what we do every day, right? These are um, the, uh, through pharmacy, the pharmacy champion will review uh, antibiotics that are prescribed and then, uh, you know, is available to contact us anytime and, and discuss uh, the antibiotics that are prescribed and are they appropriate in real time. Uh, and, and really prospective review and feedback has, has been shown to be superior to pre-authorization or restricting antibiotics. Um, but you know, there is a place for pre-authorization uh, and really it's looking at each individual case by case. And you know, if, um, if there's a, a reason that certain antibiotics like carbapenems or um, you know, daptomycin or something is being used too much uh, or when other antibiotics would be, uh, could be used or would be more appropriate, uh, you know, we'd be happy to discuss that with uh, with your facility, but um, really prospective review and feedback is the way to go. And that's what you all do with us. So you meet that requirement. Um, and if you want to have pre-authorization, you, you know, developing some pre-authorization for like really um, broad therapies like cefadericol, for example, or like... Um, you know, isobuconazole or, you know, really expensive and newer drugs, if there's alternatives, creating pre-authorization, if it's only limitedly used, will also show some evidence you're doing that. But for the most part, prospective audit and feedback is, uh, meets the requirement when they say one or both. And then implements at least two evidence-based guidelines to improve antibiotic use for the most common indications. So these are some examples. So they're community-acquired pneumonia, UTIs, skin and soft tissue infections like cellulitis, C. diff infection, asymptomatic bacteria, uh, parental to oral antibiotic conversion, use of surgical prophylactic antibiotics. So, um, and a part of this is updating order sets and, uh, you know, uh, for departments, especially. And, um, and yeah, I, I think the hospitals have really done an excellent job with this one, especially. So if you wanna show that if you're meeting guidelines for this component, like picking two that works for you all and prioritize that, they just want you to do two. So for example, if you have a C. diff order set, just making sure you have all the right treatments and they follow in guidelines and then teaching to that. So like, you know, when Dr. Horn and I make a C. diff webinar small with questions, so then you, you could teach everybody about C. diff, but at the same time, you could have order sets for C. diff. Um, so, you know, whatever is priority for your facility that you want to work on and then kind of implementing that and following the data. So it's not only implementing, but it's also essentially tracking. And the program evaluates adherence uh, to some of the evidence-based guidelines. So you, you make uh, the guideline and then you see, is it being followed? And measuring adherence uh, to the, uh, and this is departmental unit, uh, clinician subgroup or the individual prescriber level and may obtain ad, uh, adherence data for a sample of patients. So. Uh, not only making the guidelines and, and making the um, the interventions, but also are they being followed? So let's say the prior thing we talked about, you're going to focus on C. diff. Then evaluating would be, is it possible for you all to review all the C. diff that are positive in the hospital, right? 
So like, you're going to teach about C. diff. Now you're going to look at all the C. diff that comes to your hospital, create an alert or making sure. And then you make sure they're all on the right treatment and not metronidazole. So they are on vancomycin or fidoxamycin and not metronidazole as their primary treatment. So teach, order set, making sure that we're following the order set and what we just taught. Or you have surgical um, um, you know, prophylaxis and making sure now people are using for the pre-op uh, order set, NSEF and not erdapenem. I'm, you know, I'm back to erdapenem because we used to have a lot of that. So just making sure you create something and you're kind of keeping a track of like, are we following that? And then are we following that? And then giving feedback <clears throat> and reporting it. And so this part is the reporting data to hospital leaders and prescribers. And, and this is what, you know, I was mentioning before as, you know, if the clinicians and the prescribers, if they see, oh, we're doing uh, a good job, that will motivate them to continue doing a good job. Um, or if they see, oh, we can, you know, do a little better in this or that area, uh, they'll understand how things are going. Because if they never hear feedback of how things are, uh, are, are we meeting our goals? Are we prescribing well? Um, then, you know, they may kind of fall off and, and not understand the importance of it or not understand the fantastic job they're doing. Uh, so it's, it's really important to um, not only uh, make the intervention, collect the information, and then report and tell people. And sometimes this can be uh, done, example, for the emergency medicine, they, it can be posted uh, in, in some areas where they can see, oh, this is, you know, our prescribing habits and we're doing a wonderful job or, oh, we're giving too much of a certain antibiotic, we can, uh, you know, switch to a different one. Um, so getting feedback can re be really helpful. And for this requirement, so let's say that you're, you all are using a Zoho to put your intervention, then you could say, see if they were all on the right treatment, here's our pattern, nobody's 99% we're following. Um, but let's say that um, you don't want to do that. You want a different option. Antibiogram. So antibiotic resistant pattern can be outlined using facility antibiogram. So that's another option. If you're a big facility, you have antibiogram. You could kind of every year say, you know, share with med staff. Here's how E. coli was and ceftriaxone was great. Here's where we are now. It's 78%. So just showing the over the years, sharing that data. Um, but having that physician leader, um, stakeholder, um, and making sure that data goes back to med staff once or twice a year is very helpful. And here it is uh, developing important uh, interventions to address issues uh, identified through its assessment activities and then monitor the effectiveness of interventions through further data collection. Uh, and we can provide uh, a gap analysis tool. It's essentially looking at these requirements and then next to it, are we, are we fulfilling that requirement for our facility? And this is just an, we just discussed it with joint commission and this is the same thing for CMS. So it, it's exact same thing, it's overlap. So just like, you know, CDF guidelines, follow CDF treatment and then give feedback. This falls into the exact same thing for CMS. I'm just using that as an example. Next slide. And this is providing documentation of improvements and the sustained improvement toward the proper use of antibiotics. And this is along the lines of what we were discussing about, you know, tracking and making sure that you're making progress. Improved resistance rates through antibiogram, fewer hospital acquired C. diff infections, decreased targeted days of therapy with, uh, for example, vancomycin. So showing that you're making progress. and takes action on improvement opportunities identified by the stewardship program. So it, it's the same as the, the previous. It's uh, identifying trends, making sure you're um, making improvements. And, um, you know, with stewardship programs, it's, it's important not to have too many, uh, you know, interventions at once, but getting some interventions, getting some progress on them, and then moving on to the next intervention is, is uh, one of the best ways to go. Yeah, I like what you just said, Dr. Horn, like making sure you don't, you all don't identify five different things that you all want to work on. 
it's like working on one thing at a time or one to two things at a time. And, you know, you establish that they're doing well and then go to the next um, would be the appropriate thing to do. And next slide. Okay. okay. Uh, lastly, so I think just taking away from all the joint commission updates and looking at all the CMS updates, they want all of us to make sure you're including stewardship meetings with major stakeholders. So however you want to design it for your facility, they want to make sure you have, you're discussing that. And for that, you need to have a, also a physician or a pharmacist or both leading this effort. And working with us helps in a lot of those requirements. Um, and then of course, for the competency base, um, um, that new addition, uh, we will soon let you all know when that uh, module will be ready so that um, you know people at your facilities are able to do that and be able to get competency-based credits for the requirement that they have. And going forward, we'll also work on those small, short webinars with questions so that also can meet the requirements. Any other questions right now? I know we're over time, but it was important topic. So if you all are here and want to talk about and have other questions, we're happy to answer. All right. Well, if, if you think of any questions, please email us. Uh, thank you so much for everybody. We'll see you later. Thank you.